May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. Last week, in an email exchange with a friend, it was appropriate for me to share uh, that the word nevertheless is my second favorite word in life and in the Bible, nevertheless. It signals that part of life that is resurrection-oriented. No matter how bad life becomes for any of us, no matter how any of us screws our lives up, no matter how many mistakes we make, no matter how dark the night is, personally or in our nation or in the world, nevertheless, there's always something new stronger, even more inclusive and durable that God is bringing forth out of the midst of suffering and crisis. Nevertheless, my email correspondent, of course, wanted to know in reply what my favorite word is. And of course, that's easy for me and easy for those who know me, the answer is that my most favorite word is love. Jesus and the entire Bible agree, as documented in this morning's appointed gospel reading, that love is the most important verb there is. That was the trick question that the Pharisees posed to Jesus, and he responded very quickly in a two-sentence answer, and both sentences had the verb love as the greatest commandment. The great commandment, the most important commandment, Jesus says to these unfriendly questioners, is to love. Love God with all your being and to love your neighbor as yourself. Another way of putting that is for us to love vertically as well as love horizontally. It is the, the, the key to a sane, fruitful, healing, and empowering life to love. Now, those of you who are on our mailing list, and if you're not on a mailing list, we can fix that today. You can sign up for our mailing list by fill, filling out our visitor's card, and we'll talk about that at the announcement time. But if you are already on our mailing list, then you received... This morning at 6 a.m., a brand new 15-minute video about St. Luke's as a part of our stewardship program, Big Love, just kind of clears the way, brings it home, makes a way. This video is one of five videos coming your way. They're all stunning, inspiring. This one this morning was a stunning video of enumerating all the ministries in which the people of St. Luke's turn outward. The horizontal part of Jesus' most important commandment. The neighbor love the part of the commandment. I hope you will view it and allow your heart to beat fast as the creativity and innovative ways in which this church makes big love tangible in love of neighbor. Of course, Jesus has a secret, and it really needs to be emphasized at this point. If you separate the two-part love into God love only or neighbor love only, you're going to miss a secret, a point, a power. You cannot have one without the other. If you make your God love have no outreach, you have a quietism. 
that is so heavenly minded that it is no earthly good. And if you have only outreach without the God love, the heart love, you risk making your neighbor love into a strident act of divisive and scornful ideology. That is what too frequently is happening in our world now. We've divided the vertical and the horizontal big love. And we are attacking one another. I just want to note, speaking of stridency and scorn and divisiveness, that this morning at eight days away from the presidential and other elections, how concerned I think we all are about our country and its rising quotients of violence and divisiveness. I'm not calling about non-involvement about week after next. My wife and I are very involved, as I think every member of our faith community is, in a variety of actions to protect the ballot and to help voter turnout. I'm also, however, looking beyond November 3 and whenever we learn how the Oval Office and the Houses of Legislature look even deeper than the campaign victors is the violence quotient and the divisiveness quotient that has us looking too much like the violent divided states of America rather than the United States of America. So the second point in my sermon, the word is rebuild. While we're focusing on Tuesday week, I want to focus on the other side and think about rebuilding society with the power of love. Rebuilding society on the other side of the presidential election. Some of us are studying together on Wednesday nights Richard Rohr's book, The Wisdom Pattern, and he speaks of the process of rebuilding and that such rebuilding cannot take place without citizen leaders who are rebuilt inside. The rebuilt rebuild. The inly divided and polarized and violent and scornful contribute to the structural division, polarization, violence, and scorn. Rohr writes that experiencing God in the midst of our suffering and losses and crises, like the crises we are in right now, that God enters into every pain and loss to work the nevertheless part of life. The kind of spirit that Jesus brought back from the cross and the grave, that those are they who see their suffering as sacramental and redemptive. Show me a joyful person who's been through hell and I will show you someone who has discovered their wounds were in fact had a sacred dimension to them, who have had a realigning life experience. Those who trust that God is in the suffering, Roar writes, are literally indestructible or in Christian language resurrected from the dead and this is one meaning of being born again and has so much more to do with having come through suffering alive and more whole and holy than with some kind of emotional experience after an altar call. That's not what being born again is. Being reborn has less to do with an emotional church experience than a realigning life experience. I am inviting you, my friends, and preaching to myself to see God, who is love, as entering into every pain you and I are now experiencing, including the pain of living in America right now with all of our divisiveness and violence, so that our lives can be part of God's rebuilding, repairing the breach work in the world. 
So now the how part of this sermon. I have this friend in the parish who says, yeah, I get the what. But sometimes you don't talk about the how so much. I love the fact that St. Luke's is always insisting on the how after there's a statement of the what. Well, the first thing I want to say in the how section of this sermon is to quote a book I heard about this past week which said that this man had learned in his life that the ego is not the most stable foundation on which to build your life. The ego is not the most stable foundation on which to build your life. There is something underneath the ego which gives you more stability in life. Somewhere along the way, the ego and its promises of power, possessions, and prestige fails us. And when that happens, please remember my words about the sacrament of crises and suffering. That failure can be, to quote Richard Rohr, a falling upward. It can be a good, necessary, and godly thing for our egos to have suffered and been deconstructed. Now you're about, when this happens, we are about to move from unreliable faux stability to something that is the most stable thing on which to stand. And what is about to happen is for you to understand that when you are no longer understanding that you are your ego or all the other identities that have come from being your ego, the director of this, the authority of that, in charge of this, or failure of this, or marginalized of this, that all of that breaking away and destructiveness is making a way for you to understand that love is not only the organizing center of everything that is, and if you want to look at the truth about everything and everyone, look at the love in them and look at the love in you and then discover that your true identity is love. You are loved and you are love. Thomas Keating and so many other wonderful leaders and sages like Thomas Merton say that the root of Christian love is not the will to love. I'm not going to will myself to love, but the root of Christian love is the faith, faith that I am loved. The faith that one is loved by God although unworthy or rather irrespective of one's worth. When you and I discover that we are loved, in fact that we are love itself, and that was implanted in us at our creation and never can go away no matter what has happened to us, when we discover that, we are allowing God to change our motivation from selfishness and self-aggrandizement and all of our worldly standard identities to divine love. And that is who we are. Oh, my friends, I could have saved myself so much pain and so many psychiatric bills if I had learned that my true identity and the stable place on which to stand is that I am loved. Everything in the cosmos, the world, indeed in all of creation has a divine center, Teilhard de Chardin says. And at the center of every part of creation is a heart beating with the energy of love and compassion. Our own being is love. Ram Das says, souls love, egos don't, but souls do.
become a soul. Look around, and you'll be amazed, all the beings around you who are souls. Now, one of the things that happened this weekend that was very, very important was our Right 13 event. It was a time in which we gathered around all the 13-year-olds and prayed over them and blessed them with their parents and godparents looking on to say, we are with you in this very important year of your transitioning to adulthood. Unfortunately, because of our limited staff here today, we won't be able to show you the video that we prepared for that, but we'll show it to you next week. But what is really, really important is that they are on that journey now to discover that they themselves are love. And as they are rebuilt by love and in love and for love through all of their falling upwards experiences, then they will join the citizenry of the rebuilt who can rebuild our society. Now, last word. These are challenging times. We are having to live in such a weird way. Some of us without hugs and human contact, we can't get together in this wonderful place. Remember that none of us can do this thing without a tall drink of love. And that if we don't stop and call someone, and it's okay to call someone and say, do you love me? I say that to my wife 10 times a day. Do you love me? I need to hear it. That is beautiful. That is a way of your exercising healthy self-care to get a tall drink of love. Don't be de loved in this time. But let love flood your soul, particularly in the midst of mistakes and setbacks and bleaknesses and loss to rebuild you at the soul level so that you can rebuild our society on the other side of election day and help us all live into a nevertheless chapter of our personal, relational, political, and cultural lives. Amen.